It is 7.30 a.m. My mother has finished her morning coffee and cigarette and is in her bedroom, changing for work. In the bay window of the dining room, a small, shy sun peeks from just behind the courtyard of Barnard College. My father's day has also begun. He takes many small, slow footsteps to reach the breakfast table. He approaches with trepidation, afraid he might fall. He delicately lowers himself into the chair, but the chair is too far from the table. Mom, he says. When she doesn't answer, he calls for her again, more urgently. Mom? I can't remember exactly when I saw the first tremor and got the sense that my father was beginning to lose some infinite thing, his identity as separate from his physical condition. But I know that when it happened, it happened in a moment. A tremor can have a variety of etiologies, but retrospectively, it can be said that he had Parkinson's from the first shaky hand. In the beginning, it was just his left thumb. Later, his left hand assumed a distorted shape and trembled as one unit, as if he were playing vibrato on a violin of air. In public and at home, I wanted him to hide his tremor. On walks with him, I would gently, or sometimes not so gently, hit his hand with my own as a reminder that he should keep his hand in his pocket which he did sometimes, but more often he disregarded this gesture entirely, either because he forgot what I intended or because he was not about to be told what to do by a child. He would swing his hand back even harder to hit mine. I remember not knowing what bothered me more, that he disregarded my request for normalcy or that he seemed to be unable to remember it. It is 5.30 p.m. Every morning, my mom writes a schedule for my dad. This is not, of course, a schedule of events for him, but rather a precise account of who will be where and when. Mom at work, 7.45 a.m. Home, 6 p.m. Sam has play practice. Home, 5 p.m. Hannah, at college. My dad is now anxious about Sam, who is not home yet. He walks to Sam's bedroom, checks the schedule, and returns to Sam's bedroom. He asks Nana repeatedly what is going on. She says she cannot concentrate on preparing dinner. Sometimes I rack my brain to determine possible causes of my father's Parkinson's. My half-sister Ellen, who my mother swears speaks only in hyperbole and embellishment, once told me that when my father was a baby, his mother was immensely conscious of weight, his and hers, and worried that he would become fat. So she adopted a trend common among women of her age. She gave him carrot juice. According to Ellen, she would stop when my father's skin turned orange. In a global health course, I learned that certain nutritional deficiencies that occur during pivotal stages of development cannot be compensated for and lead to insurmountable deficiencies, some of which may arise later in life. Sometimes I blame carrot juice. Other times I hyperanalyze his history of stress. He grew up with a father who was constantly angry at leaving everything and being forced to start anew, middle-aged in New York. His mother, who had never before worked a day in her life, worked at a bomb site factory to support the family. Using a Sperry gyroscope, she would ascertain where to drop bombs based on the speed and location of the plane relative to the target. She worked at night, and at dawn, my father waited for her at the subway station. They lived in a one-bedroom apartment. His father and mother would sometimes leave him alone in the bedroom when they went out. And he was scared, although he never told them and recounted this to us only recently. To this day, he's afraid of being abandoned. This, this is what I do. I perseverate over everything. 
try to find the cause, as if laying claim to anything will provide a source of relief. But there is no simple path that will trace my father's illness, not his development, family upbringing, or anything else. Raised in a family of doctors, I am conditioned to believe that science can only help. I am accustomed to seeing symptoms and thinking pathologies, to hearing hooves and thinking horses. The knowledge may not all be there yet, but the instinct is strong. In this case, I do not think an etiology exists. It is 10 p.m. and I've decided to sleep at home instead of in the dormitory at school. And I try to finish up some homework on the computer. Down the hall, my father prepares for bed. He taps the light switch, a dimmer, repeatedly trying to turn the light off. It dims and brightens, dims and brightens. He leaves when there's a flicker of light left in the bulb. When I am angry, I think that it's unfair that I got my father at this stage of his life. I find it unfair that he was stolen and can't be found, no matter what cocktail of prescription drugs he has given, no matter the balance of dopamine, anti-tremor, and anti-dementia medications, no matter how my mother and brother and I shift our expectations of him, our standards of interacting with him. He can be reached but he cannot be found. The disease is a series of negotiations, none of them final. Once in the car on the way to our house in Connecticut, I asked my father, what do you live for? My mother and brother said this was aggressive, obnoxious even, but I truly wanted to know. He rarely smiled, even in photos he could barely contort his face into something resembling satisfaction. Sometimes, on vacations, I would hesitate to take photos with him because he didn't try. Often, his face was a result of the pain from his feet, but other times, the cause was that he could not move the zygomatic muscles of his face to form a smile. As with everything, this was not his fault, but it certainly seemed he was displeased. He spent most of his days pacing around the house, reading the schedule, complaining of being disoriented and reading the schedule again and sleeping. He was often incontinent and needed constant attention, whether in the form of assistance accomplishing simple things like getting dressed or the emotional reassurance that someone would be around in case he fell. He did not talk to any of us except to know what was going on at the most basic level of the household. I wanted to know why he insisted on living when he did not appear grateful, or to take pleasure in anything, or to even pretend to. <clears throat> Reading the paper, he said, stumbling over the words a little. Even though he was in the front seat of the car, I could sense him tensing the muscles of his mouth severely, curling his lips into his gums, trying to subdue them to form sentences going for walks in the park, sunny days. These were things that he had not experienced in a long time. He hadn't been to Central Park, his favorite place in the world in ages. My mother and brother sat in silence, uncomfortably. Sometimes I can be wild and they give up on reining me in. It is 12.30 p.m. My father will now transition from the love seat to the dining table for lunch. Nana has carefully prepared his meal, one that is soft enough for him to chew and yet has a panoply of interesting flavors and textures. Toasted, buttered sourdough bread with tomatoes and black pepper, flaked fish with sliced pickles, boiled potatoes. Everything cut into small bite-sized pieces including the toast, which makes the meal look larger than it actually is, and <laughs> this becomes a problem. Lemon is often squeezed on various things because my dad loves sour flavors, just like me. Upon seeing the meal, he complains. Too much, he laments. I wince. 
even though I know this is usual. He hates being babied, being dependent on others. To accept the meal with gratitude and grace would be a loss, so instead he asserts his agency. Before, we would let him eat as he wanted, serve himself according to his appetite, but it soon became apparent that he was under-eating and his weight plummeted. So every time he gripes, Nana tells him, you always say it's too much, but you still eat it. This is usually true. A few days ago, at dinner, I asked my father the same question, this time a bit more delicately. So what do you find makes life worth living? You, he said, in between bites. Mom, Sam, he thought for a moment more. When I was in research, the creative process. He looked up, smiling slightly. Bananas.